We have an amazing speaker with us today. Uh, Dr. London is the Thomas P. and Catherine K. Pike Professor of Addiction Studies at the UCLA Geffen School of Medicine uh, and a distinguished professor in residence uh, at, in the departments of psychiatry and biobeha uh, uh, biobehavioral sciences, uh, as well as molecular uh, and medical pharmacology. She is currently also the director uh, of UCLA's uh, T32 Translational Neuroscience uh, of a Drug Abuse uh, Training Program. Um, so I won't uh, hold this up too much any longer by going through all of her amazing accomplishments, but trust me, there are plenty. Um, but I will uh, now turn it over to Dr. London. And if folks have questions, given our technical difficulties, please feel free to relay them to us in the Q&A section. Um, so I'll turn that over to Dr. London, um, and uh, you can go ahead. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you today uh, to talk about this topic that I know is central to your seminar. And, um, you know, I've been working in brain imaging and addiction since the late 1970s. Um, I know that makes me seem very old, but you have to remember I started when I was something like 12. And the, the idea of doing brain imaging is that, you know, we really want to help people. What do we really want to do? We want to, in clinical practice, and improve treatment engagement, improve self-awareness. These are all problems that people with addictions have. Reduce craving, manage craving, regulate mood, and improve decision-making. And in doing and having those goals, what we really want to do is consider brain integrity and brain function. And we have a lot of really great tools available to us. Positron emission tomography became commercially available in 1977. Um, and in the uh, 80s, we, we moved to MRI, uh, first structural scanning and functional scanning. And we have started learning things. Um, one of the things that we learned is that it really takes a village. You want very large samples for some of these studies. And we have consortia now. Uh, one of them is the Enigma Addiction Working Group, where 23 laboratories uh, have been contributing. There are now, uh, this just was the first wave. We had over 3,000 participants over 2,000 with substance use disorders. It's, it's growing. There's been a second wave of data. And the biggest finding that we found is that in structural imaging, the biggest differences are in people with alcohol use disorder. Although we've studied people who uh, have tobacco, cocaine, stimulant, and cannabis use disorder. And you can see these wide uh, spread areas of cerebral cortex, where there's smaller volume, smaller thickness in um, many areas of the brain. But overall, when you look at all drugs of abuse in general, you see the biggest effects or the most consistent effects in a couple of regions. Uh, one of them is the insula, which is this little area um, of cortex tucked inside the brain, and also the medial orbitofrontal cortex. And, um, it's kind of important to think about what do these regions do? Uh, so the insula tucked inside the lateral sulcus is considered part of the limbic system. It's important in self-awareness, uh, feelings of disgust, feelings of um, emotion. It's important in decision-making. Uh, the level of risk that someone is exposed to in a certain uh, situation, is correlated with activation of the insula. Also activated by love, drug craving, and all sorts of uh, activities. Um, it's linked, uh, importantly, to the thalamus so that it gets all kinds of sensory information which comes through the thalamus. It's linked to the amygdala so that um, uh, the impression that the person has of the environmental conditions can uh, be linked to emotional memories so that they, uh, evaluate the situation and making a decision going forward. It's also linked to the anterior cingulate 
prefrontal cortex, uh, which is important in emotion, uh, impulse control, and linked to the striatum in terms of selecting activities in response to environmental stimuli. The insula got a big push in terms of importance in 2007 when Nasser Nakfi at the University at, at, um, at the University of Iowa uh, published the study on people who had strokes. Um, the University of Iowa has large collections of uh, patients with different kinds of lesions. So this was an essentially a lesion study. And what he found was that people who had damage to the insula, strokes that involved the insula, quit smoking. And um, so of 69 people, uh, 32 quit, 16 maintained abstinence from smoking. And over here, you can uh, see the red ones are those who maintained abstinence. And those with the insula stroke had a much stronger effect than those without the insula stroke. There were fewer people who quit. Now, you know, it's crazy um, with sample sizes like this, you can't publish today. But this has been a replicated finding that uh, has kind of uh, really led what we did in a lot of areas, such as brain stimulation that I'll mention later. The medial orbitofrontal cortex, which is the other area that's routinely uh, in um, gray matter volume and thickness um, uh, is very well connected to other areas of the brain. Uh, you see these connections to um, the caudate nucleus, the nucleus accumbens, the globus pallidus, and the thalamus. Um, it's in a very privileged position in the brain. It receives information from every sensory input. As a result, even more so than the insula, or at least just as much as the insula, it can be uh, involved in the selection of the appropriate action, depending on um, how these environmental stimuli appreciated through the sensations uh, make the individual think uh, the choice will take them. So the question is what happened? You know, did drugs of abuse mess up everybody's insula and medial orbitofrontal cortex, or were there pre-existing differences? And there's a study that was done by Karen Urshi in 2012, uh, where she studied uh, individuals who had stimulant use disorder uh, in the UK and their non-addicted siblings. And what she found was uh, those that had the stimulant use disorder and their non-addicted uh, siblings had larger amygdala and putamen volume and smaller volume of the post-central uh, gyrus, the insula and the superior temporal gyrus. So that would imply that there is a predisposition uh, that led to these structural brain differences. But really the only way to know that is to do a longitudinal study. And there are several that have been started. Um, this one is a study of alcohol use disorder where adolescents have been studied for um, years. The study began um, in uh, people who were at the age of 12 and it now has uh, individuals that are in their 20s. And this is a paper that came out in 2018 uh, from um, the Stanford group with Dolph Pfefferbaum and Edie Sullivan. And uh, the colored areas um, show um, kind of uh, things that happen um, with respect to a difference in development of the brain, like an actual influence on the trajectory of development um, after the initiation of drinking. And so um, you see uh, reductions in gray matter, uh, reductions in uh, volume, and the bright orange areas uh, show those areas where the declines over time were greater. So these are in fact effects of alcohol. Um, another study, the largest one, 
um, that has been initiated is the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. Um, it's got well over 11,000 children starting at the age of nine, and they're being followed into early adulthood with structural functional brain imaging, genetics, um, and a very and school performance and a lot of other assessments. It's a very rich data set. Um, it's a wonderful data set because it's ethnically diverse. And so it's possible going forward, although this hasn't been done, uh, to evaluate the interaction of um, uh, low socioeconomic status, um, ethnic, ethnic racial minority status with uh, substance abuse and brain development. So let's talk a little bit about the techniques that um, have been available. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, uh, positron emission tomography has been available um, commercially since the late 1970s. Um, and the way it works is that an individual is put into um, this instrument, looks like a brainwashing machine. Uh, they're going in and they receive a radioactive tracer that is uh, going to track the um, uptake of the tracer into different brain regions. And the uh, there's in the gantry, there are a series of detectors that can detect when there are, um, there are positron emission events with photons being detected at 180 degrees from one another, uh, indicating that there was a positron emission tomography event. So there was a, a PET radio tracer accumulating there and a computer system is gonna reconstruct an image of different slices throughout the brain showing you where the activity occurred. This is a picture of glucose metabolism with really high activity in the basal ganglia and the cerebral cortex. And um, positron emission tomography was uh, used for um, the earliest study of cocaine craving, uh, which we did at the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, and published in 1996. And the way the study was done is that uh, the participants view videotapes uh, that remind them of their drug taking and um, induced intense craving. And we measured glucose metabolism with this tracer for glucose metabolism, fluorine 18 deoxyglucose labeled with this positron emit emitting radio tracer and got a picture of glucose metabolism, which is an index of function. The faster cells are firing, uh, the more they need glucose. And what we found was that there were differences between people who were high cravers and people who were low cravers. So when they viewed neutral cues, which were pictures and videos of people doing arts and crafts, which I thought were just great, but they didn't find very exciting. Uh, they, um, as compared with cocaine cues, the pictures of you know white powder or things that reminded them of cocaine, the low craver showed no difference in their brain activity measured with deoxyglucose, with fluorodeoxyglucose. But the high cravers showed a big activation in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the medial temporal lobe, uh, uh, especially the amygdala. And there was a, a very high correlation between the change in craving from viewing the neutral cues to the cocaine cues uh, uh, in, uh, with the uh, change in glucose metabolism. So you have the low craver down here, no change, and you have the high craver up here, big change. And so this kind of told us that, um, that the amygdala, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, they're all involved in this uh, this feeling state of craving. Not only that, uh, we also found that it was that that feeling state 
was related to dopamine release in specific brain regions when people were viewing these videotapes and reporting on how much they were craving. Uh, here, we were not measuring glucose metabolism, but instead we were measuring dopamine release. And we measure dopamine release by using this radio tracer, which binds to D2 dopamine receptors. And here you can see a picture of the tracer binding very heavily within the caudate nucleus on the putamen. And um, the concept is that if dopamine increases in the synapse, it's going to compete with the tracer and there's going to be a decrease in binding. So decreased binding reflects dopamine release. And in fact, the change in, in dopamine receptor occupancy, meaning the decrease in binding, was very, very highly correlated with uh, the craving score. And two labs, um, our lab in Baltimore and um, the University of Pennsylvania had the exact same finding and published it in neuropsychopharma uh, neuropsychopharmacology in the Journal of Neuroscience in 2006. So this concept that dopamine is released uh, by cues that induce craving has been replicated for drugs of abuse other than cocaine. We did it with smoking and uh, here, we have PET scans from before to after uh, somebody smoked a cigarette or basically took a break. This study was done at the VA, the West Los Angeles VA, and we took the veterans who smoked a lot. We did a PET scan and measured raclopride binding before, and then the break and after the break. And some of the people, when they were in the break, they weren't allowed to smoke. And some of the people, in, during, they, during the break, smoke. And what you can see is if white and yellow represent lots and lots of binding, you see a decreased binding, meaning the dopamine release and competed with uh, the radio tracer. But what you also see is there's a lot of variability uh, in the response to smoking a cigarette. Uh, even though dopamine release was related to um, craving and, um, and feeling good after they smoke, what we found was that um, genotype had a lot to do with who released a lot of dopamine when he smoked and who didn't. And uh, for example, the dopamine transporter uh, 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 gene uh, with um, the, uh, those who had the 9R variant showing the big effect, those who didn't have the 9 our variant showing no response to smoking a cigarette. Uh, DRD4 was also important, as was catecholamethyltransferase. Uh, the Val-Val um, individuals showed a big response, and uh, the Val-Met individuals that we studied had less of a response. So uh, dopamine is important, and um, Nora Volkov had shown that drug-induced euphoria is that the high that someone gets when they smoke a drug is a uh, relative to uh, the change in dopamine in the synapse. So decreased binding is related to how high somebody is. And we believe, and all of these studies have been with the D2 variant, the D2 subtype of dopamine receptor which is, shows the deficit in every um, addiction that has been studied. Cocaine, individuals have cocaine use disorder, a methamphetamine use disorder. These people have approximately a 15% deficit in D2 dopamine receptors. That 15% makes a difference though. Um, alcohol use disorder and uh, heroin use disorder. People who smoke cigarettes show, a, among people who smoke cigarettes, there is a deficit in D2 dopamine receptors in men, but not in women. Uh, so uh, the D2 dopamine receptor is affected differently, and it may have to do with the fact that nicotine has differential effects on dopamine release, which can then downrate the receptors in men than in women.
So this is all really important for executive functions because I mean, basically what you have is you have, um, you have motivation and action that involves striatal function. So you have dopaminergic innervation of the striatum and, um, and uh, um, ventromedial prefrontal cortex as well. Then you have uh, cortical inhibition and modulation of dopaminergic function as well. So corticostriatal striatal interactions are really key to decision making. Um, and this link between the prefrontal cortex and the striatum is highlighted uh, by the finding that glucose metabolism in the orbitofrontal cortex is highly correlated in individuals with different substance use disorders with striatal D2 dopamine receptor binding. So the striatal D2 dopamine receptors really make a difference in orbitofrontal function and ultimately we believe in decision making. The other thing that we can think about is aside from craving and decision making, we have uh, really kind of personality findings, which may not be trait-like forever, but uh, impulsivity has been linked to substance use disorders in general. And um, using this five-factor model of broad impulsiveness scale developed by my colleague, Steve Reese, uh, individuals with methamphetamine use disorders see themselves in self-reports as more impulsive, whether it's in cognitive measures, uh, such as items that, um, that query their uh, planning um, as opposed to impulsive action and behavioral measures such as inability to sit still and things like that. And um, what you can see, uh, these, these areas, these colored areas on the PET scan show those regions where individuals with methamphetamine use disorder not only have this 15, 14 or 15% reduction in D2 dopamine receptors, but also a correlation between uh, self-report of impulsivity and receptor binding. It's a negative correlation. Those people who have a um, higher receptor density are less impulsive and vice versa. So this, um, this concept of the importance of the D2 dopamine receptor and impulsive action um, led us to think about this model from you know, 1984 by uh, Logan and Cowan um, about um, the direct and indirect pathways. So for example, the direct pathway, which uh, is initiated by activation of D1 receptors, uh, which are low affinity uh, receptors that require a burst of dopamine, uh, such as uh, one might expect with um, an imminent reward in the environment, uh, this direct pathway um, through inhibiting uh, the globus pallidus and um, thalamic uh, pathways ultimately uh, disinhibit thalamic pathways to inhibit ultimately corticospinal pathways, which uh, promote action. On the other hand, unlike the direct pathway, which involves the D1 receptors, the D2 pathway um, is the indirect pathway. It's the no-go pathway as opposed to the go pathway. And it is activated by D2 receptor uh, stimulation. Um, the D2 receptors are very high affinity and they are they're active by tonic they're activated by tonic dopaminergic release. And through the indirect pathway going first to the subthalamic nucleus, ultimately to uh, the globus pallidus par pars interna, um, it then has a modulatory effect um, by inhibiting the thalamic um, uh, pathway that goes to the cortex. So there is a balance between the D1 and the D2 um, systems and 
this balance um, could be disrupted and stimulant use disorder and other addictions. So for example, in our pet studies where we used um, a radio tracer that binds to D1 receptors, we saw no difference between healthy control and methamphetamine dependent individuals. On the other hand, we saw this, this substantial um, decrease or deficit in the D2 receptors. There's also a tremendous overlap. You know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people with methamphetamine use disorder, as far as the D2 dopamine receptors, they look like healthy controls. It's just that overall, the group shows a deficit. There are some people who have real problems. So the question is, are we fighting an imbalance between the direct and the indirect pathways? Um, and to some extent, um, that's still an open question, although we believe that is the case and we'd like to improve the balance. So I'd like to just move a little bit now to um, the other main technique that's been used, uh, and that is functional magnetic resonance imaging, which kind of involves um, a study of blood flow with the concept that as um, a brain region is activated, don't we love getting these ads all the time? <laughs> no, we do not want that. Okay, as the region is activated, there's an increase of blood flow and an increase in the ratio of oxy to desoxy hemoglobin, providing um, a signal that we see with MRI. And one of the first studies that was done was done by Hans Breiter, and he showed that compared with administration of saline in people, cocaine produced activation in the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, the globus pallidus, and the substantia nigra. And um, that was a very early study. And uh, there was another study uh, that uh, involved decision making. Uh, it was kind of a trivial decision. It was like a guessing game. It was like, do you think the car is going to be on the left side of the house or the right side of the house? Really just guessing. However, um, the activation in different parts of the brain separated out patients at a VA hospital who either relapsed or stayed abstinent. And in people who had activation of the insula, the, parietal, the uh, inferior parietal cortex, uh, the middle temporal gyrus, and the caudate putamen and the cingulate cortex, the activation predicted that they were going to stay in treatment, whereas the relapsers did not, uh, did not show this activation. So there are other kinds of behavioral assessments that can be done. Um, with respect to um, impulsivity, we talked about a person's impression, his self-report of his impulsivity. But we can measure impulsive action in the laboratory. We do it with the stop signal task, which is kind of a, a measure of motor response inhibition, uh, a measure of how fast someone can stop when a child runs in front of this car or, uh, that kind of thing. And a stimulus is presented and what's measured is a person's response time. That's called the go reaction time. But um, every, within 20% of the trials, usually there is an auditory prompt, which tells the person, stop, don't push the button. Don't indicate, you know, that the stimulus occurred. And the time uh, that it takes uh, the delay that will allow half of the people, the person to successfully stop half the time is measured. And the difference between the go reaction time and that delay is this measure of the person's ability to stop the stop signal reaction time. Now the stop signal reaction time, having a small one is good. You want to be able to stop quickly. Individuals with methamphetamine use disorder are impaired and their impairment is directly related to how much they use. 
Not only that, but the stop signal reaction, reaction time is related to dopamine receptor availability. Uh, how many D2 dopamine receptors um, are binding the radio tracer. And you see that individuals with the smallest stop signal reaction time um, have uh, the highest receptor binding in the caudate and putamen. And um, what you see uh, in the pictures, the brain pictures, are correlations, uh, the correlation between receptor binding and um, stop signal reaction time. Uh, stop signal reaction time not only uh, is related uh, to, um, to dopamine receptor availability, but brain activation during successful stopping is related to dopamine receptor availability in the striatum. So you have a relationship between behavior, function measured with fMRI, and brain chemistry, dopamine receptors measured with, um, with positron emission tomography. And you have these positive relationships with receptor binding in the insula, prefrontal cortex, and the striatum. So more complex than a laboratory test of um, ability to stop motor response inhibition are these uh, tests of decision-making in the laboratory, which model real-world decision-making. So in the real world, uh, people have these choices between drug use and sobriety, criminal activity, risky sexual behaviors. And within the lab, uh, we can model high versus low-risk behavior. We can um, especially do this with um, using reward, monetary reward. And one of the tests that is key is the balloon analog risk task, which kind of does what you think it would do. Uh, a balloon shows up on a computer screen and a person is given the information that every time he pumps the balloon, um, he could potentially get another 25 cents at the end of the, at the, end of the test. But if he pumps too many times, there's going to be um, a balloon explosion and he would lose everything on the trial. And we could then do a parametric analysis to test the linear relationship between pump number, which is kind of an index of the stakes. It is the stakes represent risk and reward. So the high, you know, we're asking the question, what areas of the brain show a change in activity when considering the stakes? And um, Rao, who originally did an fMRI study with the balloon analog risk tax, showed that the prefrontal cortex, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the insula um, show this correlation between the stakes and brain activation. We took it a little bit further. And we showed that, for example, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, the, the modulation of the bold signal, the relationship to uh, the stakes was highly correlated with striatal D2 dopamine receptor availability. Now, every time somebody um, gives, is given the opportunity to pump the balloon, they can also cash out and say, I'm not going to take the risk. And what happened, what happens in healthy controls, and this is a study of healthy control people, when they decide to cash out, the uh, modulation and the nucleus accumbens is correlated with the amount that they can receive when they cash out. And this also is correlated with D2 dopamine receptor availability. That relationship or those relationships that we see in healthy controls is absent in people with methamphetamine use disorder. There's a tremendous difference or highly significant difference between um, modulation by risk in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex between healthy controls and people with methamphetamine use disorder. There's no significant cortical modulation by the, by the states and people with methamphetamine use disorder. However, when they're taking risk, uh, when they're deciding to uh, 
pump the balloon, the activation is correlate and the ventral striatum is correlated with the stakes. So one of the things that I'd like to mention is that there's been a lot of um, lack of reproducibility in brain imaging studies. And the worst cases are in these brain wide where people are looking for whole brain correlations with the parameter. And this paper just came out. I don't think it's gotten enough attention. It said that you really need thousands of individuals to have a reproducible finding. So these investigators um, capitalized on uh, data collection in three very large series. Um, they included the ABCD longitudinal study with like 11,000 some people. They included UK Biobank, which has older people and has something like 35,000 scan uh, people scanned and another study, I can't remember which one it was. And they had a sample of 50,000 and they found that really uh, the effect sizes were smaller than you would think. Um, and that smaller studies that are really underpowered have inflated effect sizes. And the typical sample sizes, it kept growing every year. I mean, it used to be that you could publish an fMRI a uh, uh, whole brain study with 18 people, 25 people, then 50 people. They're saying you need thousands. And um, what happened was they kept, they, they, they took this 50,000 and they, they determined the parameters in smaller and larger and larger, larger groups. And they showed that um, they could improve replication with larger sizes. Uh, the data were better with functional than structural MRI. They were better for cognitive tests, like the balloon analog risk task or the stop signal task, as compared with mental health questionnaires. And they were better when they used multivariate um, methods. And the problem's not as bad uh, when you do lesion studies uh, or when you are testing the effect of an intervention or you're evaluating a change in a person. But these, you know, but these studies of uh, trying to get the global um, neuronal signal of a disease type really require thousands of people. So just what have we learned? We've learned that um, with addiction, there are structural differences. Um, in many brain regions with the biggest effects linked to alcohol and overall uh, the insula and orbitofrontal cortex, the medial orbitofrontal cortex. And there's some evidence for predisposing factors, but that study that I showed you from Stanford on alcohol in a teenager shows that there are definite effects of alcohol on the trajectory of brain development. With molecular imaging and PET, um, we, we used um, functional measures, glucose metabolism, also oxygen 15 blood flow has been used to show the importance of the prefrontal cortex and the medial temporal lobe in craving for drugs of abuse. Uh, craving as well as the acute effects of drugs involve dopamine release. And there's an imbalance in the D1 versus the D2 systems. Um, functional MRI has shown that cortical activity can predict treatment outcome, and it's linked to D2 receptors, uh, which uh, determine inhibitory control and adaptive decision making. So we believe that um, improving signaling through D2 receptors um, can improve executive functions in individuals with these disorders. But yet, um, in going to treatment centers and we're trying to recruit at the treatment centers, I, I found that I couldn't do D2 receptor dopamine uh, PET studies because the individuals were receiving all of these medications that would confound the, um, the studies that I wanted to do. But yet, it, it even gets worse if you think about the fact that these patients have compromised D2 receptor signaling 
but yet they're given D2 receptor agonists, therapeutic antagonists, therapeutically, olanzapine, risperidone, eripiprazole, um, lithium, um, quetiapine, uh, hydroxyzine. So people, uh, people who have trouble sleeping in treatment centers often get hydroxyzine to help them sleep. Um, maybe they could have something else that could help them sleep without compromising their D2 receptors. We have been looking for ways to augment D2 receptor functioning. And um, we evaluated an exercise program, an eight week exercise program, three times a week as compared with an education program. And there was um, no significant increase from pre to post treatment and individuals that got an, the education program, but increase in D2 dopamine receptors. And this is test retest in the individuals where the test retest reliability of the measurement is very, very high. And um, it's a small sample size. It was only 10 people. We're um, extending the study now that COVID is allowing us to recruit individuals again. But of these 10 individuals, every single one showed an increase in striatal dopamine receptors in all regions of the striatum. And what came out after we did our PET study was this finding of um, a randomized clinical uh, trial of exercise versus the health education program. And uh, they had a larger sample and um, they, they didn't have everyone inpatient for eight weeks the way we did. They were generally... Um, inpatient for um, four to 12 weeks, uh, for four weeks at least, and then they were continuing on an outpatient basis. And what they found was the people, in terms of days abstinent, the people in the exercise intervention did a little better um, than those who had the health education intervention. It wasn't significant, but when they, um, when they corrected for um, whether the individuals were maintaining the exercise after they left the in inpatient program, they found that the effect was indeed significant. So brain imaging has told us something about the biochemistry and the circuitry that's related to addiction. And with respect to the biochemistry, we would like to use medications if possible or other treatments that could change the chemistry. But the biggest, one of the biggest things right now in um, neuroscience treatment is brain stimulation. And in fact, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is now FDA approved for smoking cessation. And here are some of the preliminary data that uh, came out of a study in 2017. And what happened, uh, what they showed was just one session. And of course, um, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is often the site that's selected. Right now, uh, we're working to refine the selection of sites, which maybe need to be different for different people. But you see this big effect compared to sham activation, big effect to reduce activity in uh, the nucleus accumbens and the right medial orbitofrontal cortex. Now, I think that there is tremendous room for improvement in terms of um, making these effects tailored for in the, in the individuals. And I just like to talk about the study that Kelly Cosgrove at Yale did. And you can, if you go to her paper, you can look at a movie of dopamine release. And what you see that in men, um, smoking a cigarette, um, what, you, what you see is this big dopamine release in the ventral striatum of men, but not women. And um, there's other information that suggests that some of, some of the information from my lab, for example, that men are very sensitive to the dose of nicotine in a cigarette, whereas women 
they don't care, you know, they, you know, just smoking the cigarette uh, does the same thing for them. So there are big sex, smoking a cigarette with no nicotine will do the same thing for them. So there are sex differences in response to smoking. Uh, there are likely sex differences in response to various drugs of abuse and in the behaviors that support addiction. So that's really all I had to say. I apologize if I spoke a little fast, but I was trying so hard to compensate for um, the technical problems that we had before. And I'd just like to acknowledge these wonderful people who have been working with me um, at UCLA actually uh, for 23 years um, and um, grants that we've received from NIDA and private individuals.